I never realized how much pressure we're under, how oppressive it's become until I leave. I was in prison for about seven years, accused of terrorism. We have a mission to the public, journalistic mission. I started to highlight what's going on in Raqqa. The media was not reporting about ISIS. I was uh, uh, jailed four times. There were no independent voices on the ground. It is very difficult for uh, the electronic media and, and the print media to raise voice uh, against uh, the enforced experiences. Terror laws are being used against journalists all over the world. This is a battle that we can win. Stay committed to telling the truth, tell the stories of people in trouble and those in need. They tried to intimidate us repeatedly. We say we never give up. It was so important like, to be the voice of the voiceless, the voice of the people. The only thing that I actually promised to myself is not to ever, ever compromise on my freedom of expression. Congratulations on choosing the most important but also dangerous profession in the world. I would like to welcome everyone to this commemoration of UNESCO World Press Freedom Day, and thank you for joining us. Um, it's 30 years old on the 3rd of May, and a yearly reminder for all of us to work to uphold media freedom. It's there for governments to nurture their media environment, to respect their commitment to a free and independent press. It's there for institutions to deliver robust and frame, fair frame support networks. It's for journalists to address professional ethics, to build trust through accurate reporting. And for us, the public, to support those delivering the truth and shun any that spread hate and disinformation. It's also the day of remembrance for those media professionals who've lost their lives simply for doing their jobs and a celebration for the UNESCO World Press Freedom Prize. This year goes to Maria Reza, who's the CEO of Rappler and a fearless journalist in the Philippines. She's been under huge personal, personal attack and is a beacon of upholding press freedom for us all. She does it with dignity and courage and we salute her. This year's theme for World Press Freedom Day is information as the common good. And we've brought a very seasoned group of speakers who are delivering support, structure, training, investment, experience and knowledge to enable a robust media to flourish. Today, this event is in partnership with the Ethiopian Embassy in the UK, ELCO and the Ethiopian Digest. But why? Because the journey to media freedom in Ethiopia is just beginning. In 2018, Prime Minister Dr. Abiy Ahmed came to power and released over 8,000 media professionals from prison, unblocked over 200 websites, and enabled young journalists to use their voice without fear of, fear of reprisals for the first time. In 2019, Ethiopia, with the host of the World Press Freedom Day, and IOHR and ELICO were part of the proceedings, welcoming speakers from the UK Foreign Office Media and Freedom Campaign, the BBC, and several Ethiopian journalists to discuss what we termed as the dawn of press freedom in Ethiopia. However, 2020 came along and the world faced the dual pandemics of COVID and disinformation. But in addition, Ethiopia also has had mounting ethnic tension, delayed elections, outcry over internet blackouts, and the crisis in Tigray. It's not been an easy year. However, today in 2021, we want to discuss what needs to happen to protect media freedom, not just in Ethiopia, but around the world. How to boost its immunity and to keep its practitioners safe, to explore how global and local collaborations are working together to help media freedom to survive, to thrive and stay independent. Today is not about politics, it's about media freedom. I am going to welcome all of my guests, but I would ask for everyone watching to remember that if you, you'll have the chance to ask questions at the end, but today is about media freedom. If you're asking about politics, we're not going to entertain you today, so thank you. I am delighted to welcome my guests, and it is a very great pleasure um, to welcome His Excellency Teferi Mel S. Desta, who is the Ethiopian Ambassador to UK, 
Kanbar Hosenbor, who is a UK coordinator of Media Freedom Campaign and the Deputy Director of Democratic Governance in the UK Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. Yonatan Tesefe, Deputy Director General of the Ethiopian Media Authority. Fasika Tazide, who's a former Editor-in-Chief of the Addis Fortune newspaper, and hopefully shortly will be joined by Miret Ashasharu, who is the project manager for BBC Media Action and Primed in Ethiopia. I'd like to really ask all of our panelists to have a robust debate. But first of all, I'd like to introduce Kanabar to tell us a little bit about what's been happening from a UK and a global media coalition format. And Kanabar, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Valerie for inviting me and thank you very much for the organizers for this really important session to commemorate World Press Freedom Day. And it's also great to see that we have our Ethiopian partners and colleagues who are also embracing this really important initiative. I think I'll spend a couple of minutes really just making some reflections on the Media Freedom Coalition, how we see um, media freedom more generally, globally, and a little bit about what we're proposing to do in terms of uh, supporting media freedom. I think it goes without saying that this pandemic that we are all experiencing has really brought into sharp focus the already very difficult global environment media freedom has been under. It's quite clear that in light of the pandemic, um, globally speaking, um, media freedom has been exacerbated, not only through the pressures that journalists have faced, but also through the responses by governments and also the challenges posed by mis- and disinformation. In that regard, um, we're conscious that whilst the pandemic poses a threat to uh, public health, um, the response by governments uh, to undermine media freedom is unacceptable. We commend the journalists and other media freedom workers on the front line who are reporting on the health crisis. Their work is of paramount importance to help keep society informed, to help us all take the proper health measures, but also counter false and misleading information. And arguably, there's a strong narrative that had there been more transparency, more media, um, freedom at the inception of this crisis, we, not, we may not be where we are today. In response to that, and the role of government to support media freedom, to deliver information for the common good, is of utmost uh, importance. And I'm really pleased that it's the 30th anniversary of the Windhoek Declaration, and it's a reminder of this common good. And so far as what's happening and what's, what are we trying to do about it, I can say that the UK remains committed to media freedom and championing democracy and human rights around the world. As you know, two and a half years ago, alongside Canada, we launched the Media Freedom Campaign and the coalition to shine a light on media freedom issues, but also importantly, raise a cost to those who are abusing media freedom and persecuting journalists. So far, the Media Freedom Coalition has, in the space of two years or so, grown to 47 countries around the world. Members have committed to improving media freedom by international and domestic efforts, and the coalition speaks out together when media freedoms are being curtailed. And a number of statements have been issued on situations, including in China, Belarus, and Myanmar, but also supporting journalists on the front line through private and often public lobbying on the ground. I should also say that the Media Freedom Coalition is seized of another threat being posed to independent viable media, and that is, alongside increasing censorship, independent media is facing financial pressures. And some people have described these financial pressures as a potential extinction moment. We know, for example, that revenue for independent media has halved in the space of 10 years. This is a serious threat to 
Media Freedom and the Media Freedom Coalition I'm pleased to say this month met to look at what more states can be doing to tackle this really important issue. So I'm conscious there are a number of speakers. Um, I'll wrap up by, by making three very quick concluding remarks. Firstly, um, I want to stress to all those who are listening that the UK, insofar as our role as co-chairs of the Media Freedom Coalition is concerned, but also using our G7 presidency, we will continue to champion media freedom and ensure that we provide the right platform to defend those individuals who are carrying out this important public good. In terms of how the coalition can support countries on the ground, and in this case, Ethiopia, which as, as we all know, this year has faced some difficult challenges and also some threats to journalists. We want to stress that the coalition is here to help all countries, not only those in the coalition, and we stand ready to support by either sharing our experiences. Here in the UK, we recently passed a UK national action plan, which we'd be very happy to share with our Ethiopian partners to understand how we have brought together different constituencies like the police, government, and journalists to come to protect journalists. Also, we have the high level legal panel, which can provide independent legal advice to support journalists and media environment. And finally, there's the UNESCO Global Media Defense Fund, which provides support again to journalists in the front line. And my final thought on all of this is to stress that despite the difficult context and environment journalists and journalism is under, this is not a space where we, the international community, can afford to take a step back. And we can assure you that the Media Freedom Coalition, the UK, our partners, we will be doing everything in our efforts to promote media freedom because ultimately we believe not only is it an international public good, but through media freedom, the lives of all of us on a day-to-day -day basis will be improved. And that's clear from what we are seeing in respect to this pandemic and the correlation there is between that and the lack of media freedom. So thank you very much again for organizing this really important session. And I look forward to hearing from others, but also answering any questions. Thank you so much, Yanvar. I'm going to move straight on now to Jonathan Tesefe. Now, Jonathan has just arrived into his new role on the 5th of April, and it is an incredibly tough job to come in um, at, at, at this time, just coming up to an election um, and on the back of COVID. So, Jonathan, over to you. Tell us, tell, tell us some of the challenges that, that you're going to be facing in the next couple of weeks, months and years. Thank you for having me on this platform. This is, uh, I believe, a very important session to help uh, a media reform in Ethiopia. So thank you for the organizers. Uh, well, before I go to the challenges and where we are now, I would like to mention a couple of things that you have already mentioned, actually. But it's very important to give uh, some background before we start to talk about where we are now. So as have been mentioned, Ethiopia has gone through a very tremendous reform agendas for the last three years, uh, starting from releasing journalists to amending the many proclamations, including the media and access to information, and also the uh, computer crime proclamation, the anti-terrorism proclamation, and others that has been uh, that have been very uh, problematic for. Uh, those uh, those people who works in the media industry. So all those things considered, uh, we have come so far. And this last year, we have encountered different challenges, uh, starting from COVID to law enforcement operations and uh, the upcoming election as well has been the focus of uh, debate and discussion. And since I've come to the Ethiopian Media Authority, 
we have tried to uh, we have tried to improve our work, our work environment and uh, since we've come we have pushed for the new proclamation media proclamation to be published and be in operation and we're working on directives to uh, support and to regulate the media um, well uh, since we're talking about media freedom we believe that uh, freedom uh, should come with responsibility and accountability and our uh, institution is mandated to uh, overlook that and uh, as an independent organization the new proclamation gives it a mandate to be instituted as an ind independent institution and its accountability is the parliament and the board members that administrate the um, media authority are uh, from civil societies media houses and only two from the government out of the nine so that is a big progress from where we were because the previous uh, the previous um, media authority were accountable to the executive committee so that has changed and uh, i believe it's a very progressive and promising change and we're going to work on that uh, uh, environment. And uh, talking about the election, the upcoming election and the, uh, the pandemic and uh, law enforcement operations, as you all know, there are conflicts in different parts of Ethiopia. So we believe that the media uh, could be affected by these activities and threats. Uh, because, um, for example, the law operation, in for, uh, the law enforcement operation has been a subject, and the government has been scrutinized to, uh, in regards to media freedom. And like I mentioned, uh, media or media freedom should uh, be viewed uh, from as well accountability and responsibility. So there has been some issues. But we're trying to work hard in, in that regard, especially with capacity, capacity building, training, uh, journalists. And this, is, this has been done with stakeholders and uh, uh, UNDP, UNESCO, and other uh, very supportive stakeholders. And we're, 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 we're engaged in that area. And the upcoming election as well will be uh, uh, regulated. There are debates, there are uh, advertisement, advertisements in media everywhere, and we're, we're trying to regulate that in regards to peace building because it's very important for the media industry itself to sustain and to um, to cherish the freedom that we have uh, we, we we're having now. So uh, it will be of of course will be regulated with our uh, mandated uh, tasks. And overall, we're also focused on community radios in regards to peace building. Uh, we have about 51, but uh, currently working with uh, half of them. And these community radios are very vital for, uh, for uh, remote areas. And we're supporting with capacity building and uh, providing them with different materials so that they can be strengthened and they can uh, reach out for uh, very remote areas. And in general, we, we, we're very aware of that uh, media freedom is a very important uh, aspect of democratic process. And uh, this, um, this, we sh this should be viewed um, in, um, in the context of uh, where we were and where we're going. So we have been very in a very difficult situations in the past. I have been arrested for almost uh, two and a half years because uh, because of I uh, advocate for freedom of expression. Now I'm here to uh, and the regulatory body of the media, and this uh, will put a lot of burden on me and on my colleagues as well because we are supposed to act as an independent body. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's also another challenge because uh, the, the media freedom uh, as well should acknowledge that there are there there is accountability to uh, to the uh, to whatever reportings and analysis that we do because we want to sustain we want to 
uh, cherish this media freedom that we are having relatively from the past. And we want to um, build on that. Uh, so uh, for now, uh, I think this is enough. And uh, thank you again for organizing. Uh, and I'll be open to answer questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Yonatan. I, you know, I, I am, I'm so encouraged because you have been behind bars, you've been on both sides of, of the political divide, but you really actually understand why it's so important to drive free media um, for, for the support of democracy in Ethiopia. So it's, it's congratulations on your new role and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, could I now move to Jeremy Deer? Now, Jeremy and I met each other for the first time in Addis two years ago at World Press Freedom Day. And at that point, it was a really exciting time and he was just really beginning to work with, with groups all over Africa, looking at um, how to, to de develop the charter of ethics um, that the uh, IFJ was doing. Now, uh, Jeremy, uh, the IFJ has, has come out today with a fantastic report. If you haven't seen it, it's from the Council of Europe. I would highly recommend it. It is a very good report on press media. But Jeremy, um, you're in Brussels and tell us, tell us what's been happening <laughs> in the last two years and what's happening there with, with media freedom. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you to the other people who've um, contributed to this meeting. I think if there's one thing that events have shown since we celebrated World Press Freedom Day in Addis, it's the vital role that journalists play, from the US election to the climate crisis, from the COVID pandemic to the global campaign for vaccinations. It is not too much of a stretch to say that journalism really can be a matter of life and death for people in different communities. Sadly, in that two years as well, for too many journalists, it most literally has been. More than 100 journalists killed since we met in Addis in targeted killings. More than 1,200 have died of COVID. 270 journalists are in jail um, around the world. Well, I think what that period has also demonstrated is the precarious state in which many journalists and independent media exist. And as Kambar said, there was talk of a, an extinction threat for much of the media and that without action, the COVID crisis would pose a huge threat to journalists, to journalism, to media freedom and, and ultimately citizens' rights to information. So alongside the increasing use of repressive measures from things like new fake news laws to restrictions on movement and access to um, information, media have seen this catastrophic collapse in advertising revenue and public funding in many cases, meaning that titles have closed, online media have collapsed, journalists have been sacked, many have gone for many months without even being paid. And in many countries, the crisis has meant this creation of what people called news deserts. But even among the media that survive, the drop in their advertising revenue jeopardizes their ability to provide independent coverage, making them overly dependent on government advertising or business, criminal, paramilitary, tribal, or others who exert political or ethnic influence at the expense of coverage in, in the public interest. And the, the crisis too has turbocharged trends that we have seen in the industry over many years. So work for journalists becoming more precarious, a growing concentration of media ownership and dis and misinformation filling that void that professional journalism um, is leaving. But I think those two years and Jonathan touched they have also demonstrated the precarious state of progress towards media freedom around the world, but also including in Ethiopia. I remember in Addis, we rightly celebrated, as you said, the fact that the new government had unblocked 260 odd critical websites and TV channels, released journalists from prison, charges were dropped against some of the diaspora outlets, opposition members were appointed to the boards of Ethiopian Broadcasting Corporation, foreign based TV broadcasters were welcomed back and new publications and privately owned satellite channels were given new licenses, newspapers that had been banned were once again on the streets. Um, uh, 
uh, of Addis. And that was a cause for celebration. It was a beacon to the rest of the world and at that time. And, and while action on opening those media spaces was quick, progress on reforming some of the previous government's repressive legal apparatus had been slower. And we've also seen, as you said in the introduction, journalists once again reporting that they face new restrictions um, and in some cases harassment, foreign journalists being denied access, internet blackouts following protests, creating obstacles to journalists being able to work, problems accessing information. And the conflict in, in Tigray province resulted in a whole number of media freedom organizations documenting cases of arrest, harassment, denial of access and, and other issues facing journalists there. And in such an information void, people naturally look for alternatives and they often turn to sources of disinformation, which then add to fueling conflicts like that. Now, these issues are not all the fault of the government. Some people claiming to be journalists and media must look to themselves too. And the new freedoms and the opening up of the airwaves, sometimes blurred lines between political activism and journalism, fueling political and ethnic tensions. And while many people have used these new freedoms responsibly, some media in Ethiopia have spread hate, incited violence, and by doing so compromised the safety um, of journalists. But the answer to that is is not harsh laws or fake news legislation, criminalizing opposition views or protecting the government from legitimate scrutiny or criticism. It is to ensure that those new freedoms and rights are guaranteed by law and not just the gift of any country's leader and to ensure protection of media freedom is properly um, institutionalized. And the proclamation that Jonathan spoke about is an important step in the right direction to doing that around media self-regulation mechanisms, improved media ownership rules, fairer registration and licensing procedures, and defining rights and obligations um, of media, in particular providing for the decriminalization um, of defamation um, as well. It is important that that proclamation and the laws that flow from it are effectively implemented. But just as for Ethiopia, so for all countries, no law or proclamation is some kind of magic wand that you can wave and suddenly all the issues um, about to do with media freedom um, are solved. So let me just wrap up with a few other important steps that apply not only to Ethiopia, but to all countries um, around the world. More must be done to create a safe environment for journalists, including steps to tackle impunity for crimes against journalists. There must be no hiding place for those who attack um, journalists, no matter whether they are from government, um, from political parties, um, or from paramilitary or other organizations. Investments must be made in increasing capacity for professionalism and ethics in journalism, which can help undercut ethnic and political agendas to ensure that journalists are trained and equipped with the skills to effectively carry out their role as watchdog. No journalist who is unable to make a living or a journalist who is reliant on handouts or fearful of being sacked can effectively stand up for ethics and truth. So urgent action is necessary to ensure that journalists enjoy decent working conditions, fair pay, and that laws guaranteeing their professional, social and labor rights are effectively enforced. And in fact, if you look at the Winter Declaration of 30 years ago, there is a clause in it, I think it's clause 13, which effectively says that we were talking about it 30 years ago and it's time that there was action um, on it. And finally, international development support for building professional solidarity is crucial. Providing support to build truly independent national journalists associations built not on ethnicity, but on professional ethics, professional solidarity. And here the IFJ has a, has a long history in Ukraine, in Ireland, in Rwanda, in the Balkans of working across um, ethnic or social divisions um, and in some cases national divisions to help build independent professional unions of journalists that can stand up for the professional rights 
as well as the social and labour rights um, of journalists. And if information is a public good, which this is about, it also deserves public support. So steps to tax the revenues of global tech companies, which distort the market, including in Ethiopia. I read a lot about how um, web uh, online startups were finding it difficult because of the market conditions and using those funds to create independent media support funds with strict public public interest criteria to help overcome institutional weaknesses and, and market distortions. These are not issues that are the exclusive preserve of Ethiopia. These are issues that face journalists um, around um, the world. And it's encouraging to see steps that have been taken, but important to recognize that there can be no steps backwards, that we must continue to build on this and that the support of organizations around the world um, and in Ethiopia are, in, are an important part of developing those next steps. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy, and, and very, very wise and timely words. So um, may I, I introduce Meharit Ashru, um, who is coming to us from BBC Media Action. And she is, is driving a project called Primed, which is working in Ethiopia as well as other countries in Africa. Now, Meharit is really on the ground and doing what we're all talking about. She's, she's training journalists, she's developing new core abilities for people to be journalists and, and to work in and understand um, what, what being a journalist is. So um, I'm really interested as well. I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the work you're doing with radio, because I think Jonathan's point earlier was, was so interesting, just thinking about how to reach out um, to local communities. So if I could introduce Miharet, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Valerie, organizers and speakers. Many thanks for the opportunity. It's a very valuable uh, initiative and very interested in the topic. I, uh, I had connection issues, so uh, I couldn't uh, attend what the uh, speakers had to say, but uh, let me uh, focus on uh, the question that what can be done, what can and um, being done to support a country whose press freedom journey is young such as Ethiopia and the mechanisms that are needed to face the challenge of the explosion of infodemic disinformation and the challenge media owners and journalists and are uh, facing in relation to uh, economic uh, viability and uh, lack of trust in uh, traditional media. Why I wanted to answer these questions is uh, these are the type of questions uh, precisely Prime has been asking itself uh, throughout uh, the co-creation phase even now uh, at the implementation. Uh, Prime stands for protecting independent media for effective development and it is a three-year project to support public interest media in Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, in Bangladesh. It's also uh, an intervention trying to learn what really makes a media sustainable, uh, a project funded by FCDO and lead by BBC Media Action, brings together several organizations with different approaches to uh, media development, including Free Press Unlimited, Article 90, uh, International Media Support, Media Development Investment Fund. But one thing in common uh, we all have here, I'm trying to answer uh, the basic questions, is the conviction that what we call public interest media, media that provides trusted information, hold the powerful to account and create a platform for uh, debates is essential for development and democracy. However, public interest media, both in Ethiopia and around the world, have never been under a threat 
from uh, political and legal uh, pressure and economic downturn. And the economic impacts of COVID-19 has also intensified the pressure on public interest media throughout the world, even when their critical public role of the media becomes clear as the antidote to the raging infodemic. So what are we supporting? How, how do we support uh, public interest media in a country such as Ethiopia? As Prime does it, we work in different levels. Uh, on the one hand, we work with individual media houses that are already providing public interest content. We will be working with them to help them even make their contents better by helping them raise their editorial and ethical standards, improving their ability to properly engage with audiences so that they better understand and serve them. Quite importantly, we support them to develop an effective and sustainable business models so that, and also we support them to strengthen their managerial skills so that they can be more viable and better resistant, better resist to, better resist the shocks, the pressures from the legal and uh, economic environment. So in this regard, we have identified seven media partners, media outlets from the well-known TV stations Arts in Asha to a small community radio station in Hawassa, which is linked to a local university, which we also hope that will be an important tool in uh, the making of uh, journalists. The bigger hope, however, is not only these media outlets will provide public interest content uh, in a sustainable way, but also they will, they will inspire others to follow suit. And Primed will also be working with, at a sectoral level, strengthening organizations, institutions, that can make the environment better in which media operates. In this regard, we will be working with Ethiopian Media Authority, uh, Media Council, Ethiopian Media Council, Editors Guild, and Ethiopian Community Broadcasters. Let me leave it here, and uh, hopefully there will be a chance to come again and reflect on uh, other questions. Thank you so much. I, I, I love the fact it's called Primed because I think you're doing exactly what's needed and not just in Ethiopia, but, but you know, on, on an international level. And it, it really encourages me to see the work that you're doing in collaboration with your partners to, to prime that, that pump and that, that build of, of a more robust environment because you, know, you, are, you literally are teaching people how to fish and it's, it's fantastic to see it on the ground. So congratulations. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing how that goes in the next couple of, of months and years. Let's, let's move to debate because I know time is pressing and we've got lots to talk about. So I think let's, one of the questions I'd really like to put to Kanmar is, you know, looking at the, the investment that, that you're supporting for projects like Primed on the Ground, you know, how do you see that delivering? Is, is that what you intended with the, with the Media Freedom campaign? Thank you very much, Valerie. Well, on, on Primed, I think our speaker, I will try and uh, pronounce this correctly, Miret, she really encapsulated it very well what it's trying to do. And so I won't, I won't sort of speak over that again. From our perspective, there, we do see uh, the importance of supporting media freedom through programmatic assistance. It goes without saying 
that without such assistance, we've noted across the world that media activists, journalists will suffer. So this is going to still be a strong area of focus for us, notwithstanding the fact that we have to make some difficult decisions around our ODA spend due to this very difficult financial climate we were in. So I see work like Primed as important and we do a whole host of support globally on media freedom. I was very pleased to discover recently that we are one of the few countries who spends 1% of our ODA on media freedom stroke media development. Notwithstanding these very difficult times, I hope we can still try and match that. Broadly, insofar as the coalition campaign is concerned, we would like other partners to also look at media freedom and media development through a similar lens. And we've been using our G7 presidency to, to commit uh, some of the largest economies in the world to A, accept media freedom as a priority, but also look at increasing collaboration and information sharing on this important issue so that we can potentially look at economies of scale about projects on the ground, not only, for example, Prime, but there might be a whole host of other activities on the ground. So that's a very broad way of saying, I, I support projects like that. And we want our partners to also be thinking along the same lines. Thank you, over. And can I just bring Jeremy in on that? Because, you know, you're part of, of the, the, the collaboration um, that's on the ground in Ethiopia. But it, one of the things I thought was really important that you were raising earlier was about finance and the finance of um, how to help journalists, certainly coming out of COVID. But in terms of using money to, to support programmes like Prime so that they really are helping on the ground, but, but more importantly, nurturing uh, and, and developing so that that, that, that can local, local groups can take that up. How difficult is it to, to build those bridges through a co sort of coalition so that there is that understanding of there's, there's finance, but it's actually really got to be done on the ground and, and, and you know, developed? Yeah, I think that's really important. The, the work that the UK government and other governments do with, with overseas development assistance and with targeted um, support from some of the embassies, for example, is really important in helping to nurture independent media to support developing independent media. But it is not a long-term solution and nobody would want it to be you cannot have media that are financed by overseas development assistance for the next 50 years so the the point is how do you use that money in order to be able to develop the skills on the ground to develop the institutions and structures on the ground and the market on the ground to be able to have a self-sustaining um uh media environment and that is not an easy issue for any country um it's not an easy issue even within the uk let alone where there is a smaller market um place um and one of the issues for in Ethiopia, it has a, a relatively small number of publications and media compared to its the size of its population. It has a relatively small media market, but it also has a market that generates profits and income and revenue that are taken out of the country and this is one of the that by technology platforms by uh, communications uh, companies and this is one of the important points that a lot of media are making and that lots of governments are, are trying to find ways to address now whether through the oecd negotiations or the kind of australian uh, development of a, a a mandatory bargaining code is how do you get these platforms google facebook others who make money relaying content that's produced by local media how do you get that money put back um, into the local media in order to be able to create a more sustainable um, environment and that takes action by government it takes action by media committing that if they're going to get that kind of funding then they have to abide by certain public interest criteria they have to uh, uh, 
practice gender equality and fair employment, but they also have to uh, practice journalistic ethics and, uh, and abide by their rights and responsibilities. So it is a coalition of people in each country who can help to bring about these things, but with the support of the bigger global players who can begin to put in place the architecture to be able to tax the technology companies to be able to help develop mechanisms for delivering public support, whether it's tax breaks or whether it's it's funding in an independent, transparent and, and, and accountable way to um, local media and journalist communities around the world are desperately trying to find ways to do this tomorrow i think it is at world press freedom day there's a meeting on media viability at which you will hear examples from journalists in brazil journalists in pakistan journalists in lots of other countries who are trying to develop these models um and that's certainly something we would be happy to try to work with coalitions in different countries to develop no, I, I'm, I'm reading some of the questions that are coming in here. And I think, I mean, it struck me when I went to Ethiopia, that just the, the enormity of the task of, of having to develop a, a, a media almost from scratch. So, you know, Jonathan, you're, you've, you've come into this new role. You're at a point, we've, we're very lucky. We've got very long lived institutions in the UK and particularly through COVID when you're, you're you're looking for truth and information and you need to know you've got trust in the media that, that you're addressing. Now, we've seen on a, a global level the, the, this pandemic of disinformation that has nobody has, has been able to address. And we've seen some incredible fact checking going on, um, but we've also seen it with the American elections, um, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult and, and nobody's got the right answer. But a lot of the questions that are coming is from Ethiopia's perspective, there has been a huge disparity between disinformation, what's real, what's not. What is it that you are going to try and put in place to build that trust for the people of Ethiopia to be able to trust in their media and to be able to reject fake media as, as it circulates and, and tries to cause discord? Thank you. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very. <laughs> I mean, the challenges are huge uh, since it's a very young industry. It has been uh, through a lot. And I think everybody understands that we have a very long journey ahead of us. So considering that uh, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, build institutions, uh, starting from the Ethiopian Media Authority with the reform, the uh, uh, proclamation amendments, its accountability, and etc. Uh, but it, uh, it doesn't stop there. Uh, we're also supporting uh, media houses to form some sort of council. It has already been established. And, we're supporting them with everything we can. So we, today we have uh, Ethiopian Media Council, and we hope uh, we hope that it would help for journalists and uh, media owners to protect uh, themselves from any um, uh, harassments or anything from the executive body or. Uh, not just that, but the, there has been huge issue that Jeremy uh, mentioned earlier that medias are controlled uh, with some ethnic or political motives, uh, etc. So these things, uh, the media council and other institutions could also help to, uh, to build capacity in regards to professionalism. And uh, for journalists and uh, everybody involved in the media, to ethically uh, disseminate information that would help uh, uh, not just the people, but the media itself as, as, as a business or uh, whatever it is. So uh, basically, the I believe the Ethiopian government uh, at this moment is committed to uh, media freedom. And uh, there, but we, have, we understand that there are challenges uh, in uh, relation to uh, the above nation, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, the uh, uh, conflicts uh, here and there. 
So there are challenges. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very young industry. So there could be uh, irregularities, there could be uh, reports of harassments and arrest, but this, this all could be uh, eliminated and this all could be uh, managed through uh, the media houses themselves. They can build on what they have and they can strengthen their institutional capacities by uh, training their journalists, training uh, their, uh, even adopting their editorial policies and um, uh, moving forward with the overall reform agenda that the country is going through. That's very vital. So uh, as our mandate allows us, uh, we are facilitating ca capacity buildings uh, for uh, different medias. And we're also scheduled to do that for uh, public medias uh, uh, in the upcoming weeks so that we can uh, have some sort of progress to uh, you know, public medias are usually accused of uh, uh, aligning themselves with the government. So, and uh, on the other hand, private medias and online medias are uh, criticized for um, advocating or for um, instigating violence or ethnic conflicts. And we're trying to positively engage with all stakeholders that are operating in the country. And uh, it doesn't stop there. As our mandate allows us, we are a regulatory body. So uh, sure, we're going to take uh, some corrective measures as well. And uh, in that regard, we're developing directives uh, based on the proclamation. And I was, I was just there uh, uh, in the morning and the, direct, the directives themselves are, uh, are um, produced with independent body uh, and this independent body that is uh, that is uh, trying to produce the directives is consulting the media stakeholders themselves. So we hope that we would come to some agreement how the media should operate in the country. And uh, when and then on the media council and other institutions as well could help us to uh, kind of peer uh, regulatory engagements that. Uh, would um, help the media industry to uh, evolve professionally and ethically. So there are huge challenges, but we're not going to uh, overcome them within just a few years, not just three or the coming five, four, six, seven years, but we need time. As you mentioned that uh, countries like uh, Britain, like uh, USA, they have gone through uh, several process of uh, to get to where they are now. So we need time. That doesn't mean that uh, the government should do whatever they like because they don't like the content of uh, journalists or any media house producers, but uh, there could there should be threshold that uh, the media should respect uh, the freedom that they have. Uh, like Jeremy mentioned, it's not that uh, something that it's not a gift that the, that the government gives, but but for the sake of security and the public's interest, there could be some limits where they should uh, operate within, and that as well helps the media themselves. So we hope uh, we're going to, uh, uh, we're, we, we need time, but we're going to get there in time. Yeah, I think it's a very fine line and it's a very difficult one to, how do you, you put in the rules that don't become draconian and stop free speech, but how do you make sure that journalists are actually following the, the, the fabulous, um, uh, IFJ ethical ethical journey, which I'm, I'm I'm a huge fan of, and you know, Mirette, you're on the ground and you're you're actually training new journalists and new groups to do that. But I, I'm just wondering if if Fasika is is able to join us again because I'm really interested. What 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 does a government need to do to actually make sure that they're not overstepping and they're making sure that there's a, a free environment for media? but also making sure that the media is not providing uh, disinformation uh, and is actually sticking to their, their, their ethics. So, you know, you've been the, 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 the managing editor uh, at Fortune, which is, which is a huge magazine, and a huge newspaper rather. How, how did you tackle it? And what advice would you give now, both to, to Yonatan and the government, but also to journalists um, internally and, and internationally? Okay, so, um... 
let me start with the background. You know, the, the media industry was under a siege over the past uh, few decades, but this have, has been changed over the past two, two years after the new administration led by Prime Minister Avi Ahmed came to power. Uh, now we have an, uh, the most liberal media law. We have the better uh, ground to play and uh, to advance on. But over uh, uh, since the past couple of months, following the dispute or the conflict in the northern part of the country, it seems uh, there is a slide back. And uh, we are told what to do or what not to do, where, to, where not to go. <clears throat> and access to information has become very challenging. And uh, it seems that we are going back to uh, the, the place where we have been uh, over the past few years. And uh, you all know that over a dozen journalists were arrested over the past uh, few months, and we, things have become very challenging for uh, journalists. When coming to your question, in order to be uh, credible or to get uh, a trust on the eyes of the public or our audience's readers, viewers, the major thing we, we need to do, especially from the journalist society, is working on professional. Uh, we need to uh, comply or adhere to the basic uh, principles of journalism should do that are stated clearly in the journalism book. So all of the media companies, the professionals, or all the actors need to work on um, professionalism. And uh, thanks to the new uh, civil society's law, which is more, uh, more relaxed and which helped us to from professional uh, associations like uh, uh, independent journalists of people we have editors field and there are so many uh, professional associations which are expected to work on professionalism and uh, giving capacity building for the practitioners especially journalists editors working in the media industry and across all the platforms online digital uh, newspaper and broadcast media so the major thing uh, we need to do is working on professionalism and um, the media I'm, actors who are... I'm, I'm yes. going to inter interrupt you there just for a moment because I've got lots of questions coming in and, and one of them is okay. really about in the run up to the election, what mm -hmm. support can be given to the media to make sure that first of all, they are able to, to transparently and freely report but also my question follow up to Yontan is with the background of the election, how on the other hand, can he make sure that what is being reported is, is honest and transparent? So can I, can I just ask you just very briefly, um, what, what do you think will happen when, in the run up to the election? How do you make sure um, either through the media council or through education, it's a very short window, it's only five weeks away. Um, so what, what would you recommend for fellow journalists to do now? Okay, let me start uh, from the government side. The government should live up to the commitments it, ha it had made over the past few years. There needs to be a fair ground so that journalists will not uh, censor themselves. They should uh, work freely. And when we come to the media development actors, there should be capacity building for the, the professionals and the media industry, which is highly criticized for being uh, lacking professionalism and ethnicity-based uh, views. So we need to uh, work on capacity building in this short period of time, maybe five or six weeks ahead of the election time. So we need to work on uh, this. All actors should join hands, including the government on this aspect. and. Uh, also from our side, from the practitioner side, we, we need to work on uh, uh, meeting uh, the expectation of the people, providing uh, accurate and uh, accountable and uh, uh, more trusted information to the public. I'm, I'm just going to turn to um, Yonatan now. Um, you have got a long list of questions coming in, but just to, to touch on the, the elections, you put, you're only five weeks away from elections. So what can the government do when I mean, we've seen internet blackouts and we've seen you know, a, a, a difficult transition between how to protect people um, from, from a, a, a tsunami of, of misinformation, but also to make sure that you keep, keep the, the, the environment as free as possible. So, so what's gonna happen in the run up to the elections? 
So yeah, the, before I uh, reflect on that, uh, the the um, Fazika has mentioned a couple of things about uh, going back to where we were. Uh, I think that's premature to uh, conclude uh, such uh, comments. And uh, I believe that, in fact, the public has been demanding uh, the government to take uh, action to bring down some uh, media uh, for their involvement in a very uh, aggressive, ethnically motivated uh, uh, reportings and uh, programs that they were that they were making uh, to instigate violence, uh, ethnic communal conflicts. So uh, yeah, there has been journalists arrested, but uh, it should be clear that if a journalist violated the constitution or uh, the, the the law, uh, it's subject to that law. So I mean, he or she is subject to that law. But I understand that there could be uh, some uh, some mis uh, misgivings from the government side, uh, and there were high times, uh, especially. Uh, in relation to the law uh, enforcement operation in the northern part of Ethiopia. Uh, it's understandable. Like I said er, earlier, uh, it's a very young industry. Uh, we have a very complex situations. We have uh, this uh, ethnically motivated, uh, not just for, so, some of the journalists they are working, uh, not professionally, but as a kind of a struggle to, uh, to, to advance some political motives. So this is very complicated and complex issues that we need to address. So we have to be very careful when we talk about media freedom and the country is going back. So I, I just want to reflect on that. But uh, as uh, um, regards to the upcoming election, we're truly, as, as, as a media regulatory body, Ethiopian media uh, authority is doing everything it can to uh, positively reach out and engage with different stakeholders, uh, basically journalists, uh, media houses, not just the traditional broadcasters, but as well online content creators. We have arranged a couple of meetings previously since we, uh, my colleague and I uh, came to this position. We've tried to um, uh, put together and even to gather uh, journalists and content creators uh, to discuss and to positively engage. And uh, we're planning to meet other uh, stakeholders as well to have some positive engagements. We're doing this because we believe our priority at this time is peace and security. Uh, even the media uh, freedom can uh, thrive when the country is uh, when the country enjoy the peace and security that we uh, that is tra troubled uh, right at this moment. So it should be considered this kind of, the, the situation that we are into uh, should be considered when we talk about uh, the upcoming election and how we are going to engage the uh, the entire media uh, stakeholders. So, uh, like I said, we're supporting the media council to uh, do their peer, uh, their, their peer rela relations, uh, so that they can improve on how they report on the election, and at the same time, simultaneously, we're doing different events to uh, talk to uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders. So we hope, we hope. The, uh, the jour journalists in general and uh, media owners, we hope they understand the situation that we are right now in that the government's priority and the EMA's priority is peace and security. So we want the, the, the election, everybody wants the election, I want the elections to be fair, free and democratic. But at the same time, we have to understand the situation that we are right now in, we have to prioritize peace and security so that we all can progress together. So uh, I, I think in that way we can go long. So I think part of the problem there that, that from a from an international perspective, the moment that we see an internet shutdown, um, then everybody, you know, like us NGOs, go go crazy and go, oh my God, you know, they're silencing media. Now I, I understand that it's a very difficult situation, but if I could ask um, Kanbar and and uh, Jeremy, 
one of the things that's being leveled in the questions that we're looking at is also the responsibility of international media to be reporting accurately. And that's incredibly difficult when they, they perhaps don't have access necessarily on the ground. So what sort of um, support can be given to countries like Ethiopia to make sure that our international media is sticking by um, the, the fabulous ethics of the IFJ and actually accurately reporting and, and checking their sources? What, what advice or what activities do you think can be put in place? If, Kambar, if I can start with you. Well, it's a, it's a very big question. Um, and using drawing on my experiences on postings before, but also this role, um, I think there are probably two or three key reflections that come to mind. Uh, first is that um, we, the UK, as we've already heard, we, we support a lot of programmes on the ground, which are aimed at trying to develop best practice, resilience, capability, so that journalists in country are able to speak for themselves and put into words how they see the situation. So that's very clear in our mind. We are not there to ventriloquize on behalf of the journalists in the country. The second aspect I would probably draw on is to say that we are in regular discussions with our host countries to talk to them about the values which we share and, they, and, what we, and how we are passionate about media freedom, for example. So a lot of conversations take place, not often in the public eye, but behind the scenes whereby we impress upon our host countries, our partners, why we value media freedom, why it is, why it is a international public good. And the third is that the embassies will often use the platform that they have to either facilitate events, meetings, whereby journalists can have another platform, um, but also invite um, host countries to have a dialogue. So there are a number of ways there which we can use our, our influence, our, our relationships on the ground to ensure that everyone's legitimate concerns are addressed. Thank you. And, and Jeremy, how, how, do you, how do we keep international journalists honest or how do we make sure that they've got access to, to authenticated information? Yeah, it's, it's not always about keeping them honest, but very many journalists, one day they're writing about the elections in Ethiopia, the next day they're writing about the conflict in Crimea, and they're somehow expected to suddenly be an expert in all those um, issues, and they're given three hours to put together um, uh, a piece with the news editor standing behind them saying, is it ready yet? And they're Googling around trying to find information because they're not on the ground. And uh, mistakes get made, people don't all always get everything right and of course within a, a, a national media environment there are self-regulatory mechanisms there are fact-checking mechanisms to deal with that when it's international journalism it's much harder for Jonathan to say to about the New York Times well that story is wrong it's factually inaccurate because of this so one of the and the really, really important things is that we build stronger professional links between journalists on the ground in all countries and international correspondents writing about those issues. And often correspondents who spend a lot of time in the country have those sources. But given the financial crisis journalism has faced, there are less and less correspondents who are based in a single country covering a single um, uh, country. And it makes it more um, difficult for them so helping to build those links greater transparency and and um uh, greater recognition of the sources by international media of who they're speaking to and where the information they're using um has come from is also important um just very quickly one other issue to go back to the election um issue as well as all the 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 points that Fasika and, and other made What's really important as well is how accreditation is used during election, um, uh, how visas are allocated, how ad accreditation for attending events, and that there is a fair and transparent media accreditation process. That there is, in many countries, what we and others have done is come up with a, a charter uh, whereby all political parties sign up to, to say there will be no stigmatization and targeting of journalists, that 
that there will um, that any violence or attacks against journalists by their supporters will be dealt with properly and will not be um, uh, ignored. And also important that law enforcement authorities um, are aware of the rights of journalists and the access rights of journalists to be able to cover um, uh, those events. Normally, these are all things that would happen in training. And we've been working, in fact, some support from the, the UK embassy has helped, been helping us do this in Somalia, for example, in, in the run up to um, the elections there, working with all the different stakeholders from government, from media, from journalist unions there to try to develop these criteria for the fairest possible coverage um, of elections, whilst we also understand there are media that have a particular point of view, and that's fine, as long as that particular point of view is within the rights and responsibilities of, of all media, it's not fueling ethnic hatred or, or, or anything like that. So they're important extra aspects for uh, on top of what Fasika said about um, coverage of elections. And, and what hope is there um, really to build those connections very quickly? I'm thinking about the, the international journalist family, um, but also the Ethiopian diaspora. Um, so we've seen a huge uh, churn on social media of, of, of different um, approaches. So what from, from, a, from a journalist perspective, what can be done to to harness that to build those connections um, and from Jonathan's perspective how can he start to control uh, the, the making sure that it's it's ethical that's you know on an international media platform um, you know it's, it's out, out, out with Ethiopia's control so so what what how do we quickly build those networks I mean, in terms of building networks of journalists, so some of the questions that have been asked, someone, or in fact, two people have asked directly to me about working with the um, diaspora uh, in terms of supporting media freedom. And I've sent them my email address and said, I'm happy um, to do that. We work with diaspora communities from lots of different countries um, all around um, the world, both to support them um, when they are in exile and maybe needing support in a different country, but also supporting their press freedom or other um, human rights campaigns back towards um, uh, their own country. So I am happy. I don't know which country these people who've written are in. So I, that's what I've said to them. Talk to me and I will put them in touch with our local um, uh, unions um, in those countries. But I think from Jonathan's uh, point of view, what is important is supporting um, uh, uh, independent fact checking as well um, around election issues and that if there are concerns about international media that these facts are checked and that they are addressed directly to those uh, media because as I say very often with them it will not be a deliberate um, uh, mistake for some of them some it may be this is the difference between disinformation and misinformation misinformation has unintended is unintended but is a mistake nevertheless disinformation is deliberately seeking to hide some information or to falsify um, information and there should be strong actions taken against disinformation and encouragement and training and providing um, information to deal with the misinformation uh, part of that I think we can all deal with misinformation um, it is much harder to deal with disinformation except by shining a light onto um, uh, the falsity um, of that information and doing it again and again and again until there is a, an understanding of that. Mm, a really important point. I, I, I mean, Mira, you're, you're going to be training journalists and, and working on, on, there's already some great fact-checking organizations working in, in Africa in general. Um, what do you see as being the the key training points that that people are asking you about or that, that from your, your experience you've got when it comes to fact checking okay as i said earlier we are working at different levels at individual media level and uh, sectoral level at individual media houses we support media houses and their journalists to build their capacity in terms of ethics, ethical standards, professional standards, 
while engaging with uh, sectoral partners like we work to strengthen uh, their uh, capacities so that they can uh, they can discharge their respective uh, mandates to participate and build coalitions that can uh, maximize their contribution towards uh, the process of building uh, a better Ethiopia where uh, there is uh, ethical journalism, where there is media freedom, both guaranteed and will be put for uh, the service of uh, the greater good. Mm -hmm. So uh, the target is to make the media more ethical and professional, uh, be it fact-checking, verification, uh, other capacity building uh, trainings, uh, they target to make uh, the media more professional and uh, ethical. So at sectoral level, we do that by supporting these uh, coalitions, media houses and uh, partners like even uh, the media uh, regulating authority like the Ethiopian and, and that's a, that's a very you know that's going to take a long time to develop that as well. That's that. I, I'm just going to ask Yonatan very quickly. I'm looking at one of the questions here, and it says, um, "Would you consider receiving Ethiopian media professionals within the diaspora as voluntary media monitors during the actual election in June?" Um, now, obviously. Given, given the, the ability to, to not travel at the moment, um, I'm assuming that the offer is, is to be uh, virtual, but um, is that something you've considered? And is that something that you think might work? Sure, sure. We, 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 uh, we would welcome any help that would capitalize on our mission and vision. And uh, as long as they uh, operate in, uh, in the legal framework and uh, in 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 uh, in terms of uh, what the EME does, they're welcome. They're more than welcome. <laughs> we we need uh, any help that we can get in that regard. As uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, disinformation has become a, a global pandemic itself. Everywhere it has become a challenge for uh, government, not just government, but uh, every institution is. Uh, is challenged with a disinformation. So uh, fact checking is a very essential part of um, uh, the media these days because uh, information is like food. I mean, people decide on what they get on the information that they get in their daily life, in their businesses, and even political activities. So the decision that they make. Uh, should be or must be as much as possible based on uh, facts and based on the truth. So uh, any any uh, interested party that would uh, work on fact checking is more than welcomed in the framework of and the legal framework of the. Now I, I'm I'm looking at Ganbar there and remembering. Um, uh, Ambassador McPhail was was very gracious and and gave us tea when we came to Ethiopia. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if, if his, his fantastic living room could become the hub of the, the, the independent fact-checking international group um, for the election of the next five weeks. Um, so maybe, maybe that's something you could ask him very nicely if he would do that. And, um, you know, possibly um, His Excellency here would, would enable us to do that from London. So we, we could build that bridge and, and have the international fact checking, um, let's keep our elections free uh, and, and supported in Ethiopia. I'm very conscious we're rapidly running out of time. What I would say is that we're, we're gathering up all the questions um, that are here. And what I would ask of the speakers, if you will put up with us, um, we might come back to you and try and do private interviews so we can try and um, answer some of these questions. So this, this has been um, incredible and, and I'd like to, Introduce His Excellency to Ferry um, Melesid, pardon me, Melesidesta, just to give us a few words. You've, you've only been in, in the UK through, throughout COVID, so you haven't had the opportunity to, to really in, enjoy London as it is at the moment. But 
tell us a little bit about from your position, looking back into Ethiopia and looking out into international media. What's your, what's your hope for press freedom? Thank you, Valerie, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as you have just said, uh, I have served in Europe for about a decade uh, in Switzerland and uh, in Belgium, but I am glad to cross the channel uh, to, to the UK and also to experience uh, life here in London, uh, one of the most uh, cosmopolitan cities uh, in the world. Uh, after having said this, allow me to start by expressing my profound gratitude uh, to the distinguished panelists uh, for their insights and thank the International Observatory for Human Rights, Ethiopian Institute for Leadership, um, Ethiopian Digest for organizing such an important and timely forum on the ongoing reforms to the media landscape and their role in promoting press freedom in Ethiopia on the eve of uh, the, pre the International Press Media Day uh, that will be celebrated tomorrow. As you, as you know, since the historic transition in 2018, which ushered into power the reforming government, Ethiopia has been engaged in a raft of political, economic, and social reforms aim, aimed at the realization of a true democratic order in the country. As uh, has been rightly noted by the panelists, uh, 2018 was a remarkable year for press freedom in Ethiopia, as elucidated by the Prime Minister in his inaugural speech to the Parliament following his appointment to lead the country. In his, re in his remarks, the Prime Minister underlined the critical need to respect all human and democratic rights, especially those of freedom of expression and march these words with unprecedented decision to free all prisoners of conscience, including journalists, bloggers, and social media activists. And while unbanning over 264 media outlets and websites that had previously been restricted, as has been mentioned by the panelists. Moreover, the new leadership demonstrated its commitment to ensure press freedom by introducing comprehensive legal and institutional reforms. Accordingly, the repressive laws previously covering media activity have since been revised, and these changes have laid the foundation for a free press to flourish again in Ethiopia. As we all recall, in recognition of these bold steps taken to enhance media freedom, Ethiopia was chosen to host the 2019 World Press Freedom Day. It was reassuring to know that Ethiopia's efforts to effectively ensure the right to freedom of expression had been daily recognized by the international community. The government of Ethiopia has no misconceptions that a free, independent, and responsible media augmented by the workings of citizens' journalism is an imperative prerequisite for building a viable democratic political order. However, it is also important to highlight that freedoms comes with responsibilities, as has been mentioned. We need to ensure that the opening up of the, the media space does not facilitate misinformation, the spread of hate speech and fake news. It is sad to note that much of the international media coverage of the current situation unfolding in Ethiopia is dominated by outlets engaged unwittingly in the spread of misinformation and whose reporting has consistently failed to meet the journalistic standards they champion. In our view, this has only affirmed the need for a strong and vibrant domestic media in Ethiopia, able to independently report on events on the ground while retaining a stake in the future of Ethiopia. As Ethiopia stands at a crossroads in its efforts to build a more plural, pluralistic and prosperous society, I earnestly call upon the international community to be cognizant of the misleading reports on Ethiopia currently circulating. Now is the time for our international partners to stand in solidarity with ordinary Ethiopians in condemning 
any actions that would seek to reverse the hard fought gains of the transition and also build the capacity of media institutions and government bodies that oversee uh, the reform, uh, uh, oversee to nurture the reform in this sector. I thank you. Thank you so much, Excellency. I would like to thank all of my speakers and everyone who's joined us this afternoon. I think that we have celebrated World Press Freedom Day and we will certainly be doing that on Monday. But it's important to note that we've all got a responsibility, not only to global world freedom, global world freedom, yes, um, global media freedom, but also using the skills that we have to make sure that we can support um, everywhere that media freedom is flourishing. So I, I hope that we will continue this. I, I am very much looking forward to, to supporting Ethiopia and its media development um, wherever we can. Um, I would thank everybody so much and I look forward to speaking to you very soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>